how do you eradicate this fear? Well, in the, in the context of private money, let me ask you a question. How can you fear rejection if you're not asking anybody for money? If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the From Adversity to Abundance podcast. I am pumped today to have with us Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Jay, I forgot to say I'm Jamie Bateman, your host. Jay, how are you doing today? <laughs> Jamie, I'm doing fantastic, and I'm so excited and so thankful that you invited me to come along, talk about the subject I'm so passionate about, and of course, that's private money. I'm so excited about private money because... It has had more of an impact on our real estate investing business than any other strategy that we've implemented. Absolutely. I'm like, as you well know, Jay, if you're a mortgage note investor or a real estate investor, uh, you know, and whether it's residential, commercial, if you're a real estate entrepreneur and you're trying to scale your business, no matter what I've found, you're going to run out of your own capital, or at least the the capital that you want to deploy to into your own business and, and investments. So there are many ways to raise private capital and we're going to get into that. Uh, but this is absolutely relevant for sure for the mortgage note investor or single family, you know, rental investor who may be listening to the show, any kind of real estate entrepreneur who wants to scale, you've got to get access to capital. Um, now, before we jump into your backstory, Jay, a little bit more, what do you have going on? kind of this year, if you will? Well, this year, well, first let me say where I am and what kind of market that I'm investing in. So I am here in Eastern North Carolina and been investing here in North Carolina in this same market since 2003, focused on single family houses. I've done commercial as well, shopping center from the ground up, condominiums, townhouses, but the focus has been single family houses. We've rehabbed or renovated over 500 single family houses now funded with private money. But what's going on right now? My target market, Jamie, is only 40,000 people, oh, only 40,000 wow. people. We do two to three deals a month. So it's not a high volume like some, mm -hmm. you know, doing 200 wholesale deals a year. I mean, for goodness sakes, I don't even have anybody to wholesale it to, right? <laughs> so we do two to three deals a month, but our average profit right now this year is $82,000 per deal profit, two to three deals a month. And so these wow. deals are... Uh, now, of course, I do terms deals. I'll buy subject to the existing note, et cetera. But the mm -hmm. majority of them are funded with private money. And so right now, I've got about 10 or 12 houses at some stage or another, you know, that are sure. under renovation. Right. Yeah. What's going on right now? There's no inventory. <laughs> right. There's no right. inventory sure. in the multiple listing service. So if you price the house right, or even aggressively, you got multiple offers and it's under contract right away. Uh, what's going on right now? I'm not buying any houses and I haven't <laughs> bought any houses in forever out of the multiple mm -hmm. listing service because there's mm -hmm. no inventory. Mm -hmm. So of course we're finding all of our deals, what we call off market or direct to seller mm -hmm. for sale by owners. And we have many, many different marketing channels going on simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, I have four different vendors that are getting me Google leads, people going on Google and nice. searching for somebody to buy their house fast. We got a, two different direct mail programs going on. I got a full-time outbound caller. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're using different, mar we do Facebook mm -hmm. ads, different marketing channels to have consistent leads coming in all the mm -hmm. time. Well, I tell you, I say it all the time, mm -hmm. Jamie, if you don't have consistent seller leads coming in your pipeline every day, every week, you got a hobby. You don't have a business. <laughs> so you didn't just, when the, when the leads, when the, uh, transactions all dried up on the MLS, you didn't just say, okay, I guess, I guess I'm out of business. I mean, you, you didn't just pack it in and say, there's no way to make money in this environment. <laughs> um, and I'm guessing 
these market conditions, and I know these market conditions for you personally are not the is not the most this is not the most adversity you faced in your business. And so my guess is that you're applying some, you know, mental fitness lessons you learned along the way today to get creative, look outside the box. Hey, this isn't working. How, how do I get this done? So let's jump back to your backstory, Jay. Um, I know you've been through some stuff in, in real estate and some, some real challenges. Um, you mentioned 2003. How did things go after that? So I was raised in the mobile home business. And so here comes one of the adversity stories is, um, the consumer financing for mobile home products, also known as manufactured housing. Mm -hmm. It dried up. The whole industry fell out of favor with wall street. So in the early two thousands, um, I mean, it was in 2002, woke up one morning and had $22 million in, uh, inventory and no way to sell them <laughs> because wow. the, the consumer finance was gone. So almost had to, um, uh, file bankruptcy, but we didn't, we did workouts and agreements with our vendors, but I knew Jamie, if I ever got out of mobile homes, manufactured housing, I knew I wanted to get into single family houses, mm. uh, and not building them. I didn't want to build mm -hmm. them. I mm -hmm. wanted to, I wanted to buy this de-stressed properties and fix them up and flipping. <laughs> this was even prior to HGTV mm. uh, you know, coming <laughs> yeah. along. Be and before it was so, cool to be a flipper, you were, you were flipping houses, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so started in 2003 and the first six years from 2003 to, to 2009, from 2003 to 2009, I relied on the local bank to fund my deals. That's sure. all I knew to do. Uh, all I knew, all I knew to do is to go to the local bank, get on my hands and knees, <laughs> put my right. hands underneath my chin, beg, pull my skirt up. So they can look at my personal <laughs> assets and pull my credit score and all that. That's all I knew to do was, and, sure. and that's what most people think. That's all they know to do. And, um, that, but, but you know what? That worked great. That sure. Well, I was going to say, if it's great. working, why would you need to find an alternative solution? Yeah. Right. They worked great until <laughs> January, 2009. <laughs> yeah. We, we, well, I shouldn't say we all know, but many of the listeners likely know what happened in, in 2008, 2009, but give us a quick refresh for those who may not be familiar. Well, <clears throat> I was sitting right here at this desk and I know you may find it hard to believe Jimmy, but we actually still have landlines here in North Carolina <laughs> with, with cords. Attached. Most people nice. don't even know what a, what a handset right. is, you know, but anyway, I was sitting at this very desk. I had two houses under contract and the potential profit on those two houses was over a hundred thousand hmm. dollars. And I picked up this phone and I called my banker. His name was Steve. And, uh, so I called him up now, bear in mind, Steve and I had done a ton of deals for six mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. a ton, he'd been my guy. He'd been my go-to. And sure. so I called him up and I told him about these two deals I had on a contract. Well, I thought I still had a line of credit when I made those phone calls, mm -hmm. I'd put earnest money down on those deals, Jamie. And back in 2009 here in North Carolina, you couldn't get your earnest money back when you paid mm. earnest money. I mean, you were in the deal, right? Non-refundable. So, yep. <laughs> and so I told Steve about my deals and I learned like that on that phone call that my line of credit had been closed with no notice to me. And wow. I see, I said, Steve, what are you talking about? Why are you telling me the bank has closed my line of credit? And we've got a great relationship. Mm -hmm. I've never been late on a payment. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? <laughs> I said, no, Steve, I don't know anything about no global financial crisis, but <laughs> you're giving me a global financial crisis right, <laughs> right. now. Right. Because sure. I can't fund these two deals unless yeah. unless you fund them. I didn't have anywhere to go. Sure. He says, I'm sorry, Jay, that's, that's just the way it is. So. Yeah. I hung up the phone and I sat here for a moment and I thought, now, Jamie, I'm getting ready to share with you and your audience, the most powerful question that I could have asked myself 
during that moment, right after that phone call. And the power's in the questions anyway. And so I'm going to share a question right now that I don't care what adversity you are going through. I don't care if it's health, relationships, career, financial, whatever it is, whatever your adversity is, here's the most powerful question you can ask yourself. And here's the question I asked myself when I hung up the phone from Steve. I said, Jay, who do you know that can help you with your problem? You know, it's not how, it's who. Who can help sure. you with your problem? And who, by the way, how. Jamie, by the way, <laughs> I'm book. sorry, what'd you say? Uh, who Not How is a, is a great book as well. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's, and it, but, but, but you're absolutely right. It's an incredible, incredibly powerful mindset shift you know, um, going to ask you, asking who, not how. So, so you ask yourself who can, who can help me with this problem? problem. By the way, Jamie, these people going around saying every problem is an opportunity. I want to throw up. I didn't have no, (laughs) I didn't have no opportunity. I had a problem, right? Sure. And I need somebody to help me with my problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, hi, you know, hindsight helps with uh, <laughs> hindsight and, and maybe looking at other people's problems helps, helps maybe, you know, come up with these catchy phrases. And, and I think, I think in, after time, we end up seeing what good came out of problems. Oh, yeah. You know, but oh, but I, in the, I mean, as I share my story, yeah. you're going to, you're going to yeah, see yeah. Sure. how this was the biggest blessing in disguise. Mm. But, but I, but I couldn't be, no, Pollyanna. I couldn't be Pollyanna. We got yeah. to, we got to, we got to address this problem sure. head on. Absolutely. To, so anyway, so I asked myself that question, who do I know that can help me with my problem? Immediately, immediately I thought of Jeff Blankenship. Jeff is a, is a dear friend of mine and Carol Joy's my wife. And, uh, he was living in Greensboro at the time, Greensboro, North Carolina at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, he was, he was investing in real estate as well, single family houses. So I picked up the phone. I called Jeff and I told him the story of what had just happened. And mm-hmm. Jeff said, well, Jay, welcome to the club. <laughs> I said, what club? He said, the club of having the bank close your line of credit. He says, my bank wow. just shut me down last week. I wow. said, well, Jeff. How are you going to fund your deals? He says, well, Jay, have you heard of private money and private lending? I said, no. I said, he said, have you heard of self-directed IRA companies where individuals, people can take their current retirement funds that they're not happy with and transfer them over to a self-directed IRA company. And then they can lend money out as a private lender and make their returns either tax deferred or tax free. You ever heard of that? I said, no. And so I knew Jeff had told me something. So I studied private money, private lending, and I'm not talking hard money, by the way, mm-hmm. I'm not talking about brokers and, and mm-hmm. any kind of institutional money, private yeah. money. I'm talking about doing business with individuals, other right. people. Right. One to one, one person lends money to the other person, right? Exactly. With no Got middle it. person involved, no broker. Yeah. So I studied it. And so what did I do? You see, Jamie, here's what's interesting. From that moment in time of learning about private money to this day, although that was 2009, so Mm -hmm. currently to right now, I have never, never asked anybody for money. And I got eight and a half million dollars of private money that we use from projects to projects to projects. (laughs) Never asked. And look, I've never pitched a deal in my life. (laughs) And people ask me all the time. They say, Jay, how in the world? Do you get funding for your deals and you never ask anybody for money? Well, here's the answer. So I got off the phone with Jeff study private money. So what did I do? I said, I'm going to take on an attitude, uh, of a teacher of a teacher Mm. and lead with a servant's heart. And Mm. I'm just going to start sharing with people one-on-one and in groups. Mm Mm-hmm private lender luncheon, put on an event, have a little teaching event and start teaching people. And by, and I, start, well, I started with my own network in my own mm-hmm. connections, people I go to church with people in my mm-hmm. cell phone, people at mm-hmm. the rotary club, right? 
my own connections and just start teaching them what private money is and how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely. So the first thing I did is I put my program or my opportunity, Mm -hmm. I put my program together that I was going to start teaching. Now, one of the first things I had to get straight in my mind, Jamie, Mm -hmm. is that doing private money, borrowing private money, it's a 180 degree shift from going to the local bank or a hard money lender and borrowing money. Because when you're, when you do it the traditional way, you're selling, you're begging, you're persuading. Sure. They have all the power, right? They got all the power and they're making yeah. all the rules. Sure. They're Absolutely. making all the rules. They're doing their own, they're, they're doing their own underwriting, right? Right. They set the interest rate. They set the length of the note, all that. So I took a 180 degree shift in that mindset. Mm-hmm. I said, guess what? I'm going to make the rules. <laughs> I'm going to make the rules. I'm going to put together a program that will show people how they can safely and securely make really high rates of return. And mm-hmm. so I put my program together. I decided I'm going to start paying everybody 8% simple interest. Sure. I put my, the length of the note. I put together a program called a 90 day call option, how they can get their money back in case of an emergency, et cetera. So now I got, I got I a quick, do? quick question. Sure. Um, so I love, love that. Uh, how did you deal with the, uh, with a lot of, a lot of people who are starting out in a new business or new skill set, if you will deal with what people call the imposter syndrome. So you're going out and teaching something that you just learned yourself. And, and, and look, I'm not, I'm not a uh, throwing shade as they say, or whatever. I'm, you know, how did you deal with that? You're pushing your own boundaries, you know, with what you know, and then you're going out and teaching others how they can invest. How did you deal with that mindset shift? Well, I didn't create it by myself. All I did was pretty much copy other people's programs mm-hmm. that they were offering. Sure. Yeah, got from it. Other very successful. Other very yeah. successful. No, I love I love that answer because you're not I love that about real estate too. Generally speaking, you're not you don't need to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> it's no. it's been done by somebody else who's very successful, right? Exactly. Success leaves clues. So um didn't mean to derail us there. I was just no, curious you're fine. about that. So I put my program together that I'm gonna teach. So I take on the mindset of a teacher. And what did I do? I put on my private money teacher hmm. app. So that's how, that's how I'm thinking. Love it. Private money teacher. So I'm going to teach. So I went about, um, teaching other people what it is. And so, uh, desperation has got a smell to it. Mm. Desperation has got a smell to it. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is one thing I learned at at the, at the, at the very beginning is if I talk about my program, Mm -hmm. that my opportunity where people can earn these rates of return. If I talk about that and I talk about a deal or a couple of deals Mm. that I need funding for, I'm Mm. already sounding desperate. (laughs) Sure. That makes, yeah. The the worst time to be raising money is when you need it. When you need it, right. (laughs) For a a deal. Great great point. Right. Sure. And you know what, Jamie, I'm I'm getting ready to take a risk. I'm getting ready to take a risk now. I'm getting ready to say something you might disagree with. And That's if you okay. disagree with it, I'm sure you'll tell me, but <laughs> let me tell you what drives me crazy. I know you've heard this. I'm getting ready yeah. to say it. And I know you've heard it. It drives me stupid, crazy. These gurus, yeah. other, you know, whatever, will get on the stage or platform. And here's what they say, quote unquote, oh, just get the deal under contract. The money will show up. A hundred percent. You hear that all the time. I uh, want. I want to throw up. I want to say, where is the money going to show up? Is it just going to like rain out of clouds or something? (laughs) And another thing they'll say, another thing they'll say, they say, if the deal's good enough, the money follows the deal. Right. Exactly. That's what we hear a lot. Uh, I (laughs) wanted to disagree with you because, you know, controversy is actually good for, uh, for, for listeners and, and, and views and things. But I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it sounds good, right? It sounds like good advice. It, so, it sounds tempting to, to buy into, you know, but yeah, I mean, like you, it's a great point. Even if the money does show up, it's probably not going to be in very favorable terms because no. I mean, you, you got really to need that money. Now you're looking for money. Well, you just gave up your power. 
Sure. Right. Right. It's a great I point. Mean, you're, you're, you're now into a negotiation. Guess what? Do private money the way I do private money. There is no negotiation, right? I pay all <laughs> sure. my pri I pay all my private lenders the same exact thing. Right. And guess what? I've been paying them the same thing since, uh, February, 2009, when I started doing it. And here we are many years down the road. And you know what, Jamie, people say to me, I say, Jay, how in the world are you still paying your private and no points, no origination <laughs> fees? Say, wow. Jay, how in the world are you paying those people mm -hmm. 8% ever since 2009? Look what the market has done. The right. interest rates have gone slap right. dab right. out they of can the get, They can get 5% in a savings account. Why are they, why are they putting their money with you? Yeah. Why are they putting their money with me at 8%? There's two answers to that question. Number one, I make the rules, right? <laughs> Number two, 8% is still a whole lot more than four and a half or five. That's Actually, the, it's come down to four and a half recently mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. it's going to continue going down. Sure. So anyway, so this mindset of I'm not chasing, I'm not begging, mm -hmm. I'm not selling. Yeah, you're not We're desperate. making the rules, you know. Um, so what? Are, back, back to what I did. Yeah. So I put on my teacher hat. Now there's another mindset that, that there's two primary ways to start conversations with people about private money that don't know what private, you know, I got 47 private lenders right now. Hmm. Not one of them even knows what an accredited investor is. <laughs> they don't know what an accredited That's investor is. So and, 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 and there's a small handful of them that are actually, they are accredited. They investors, are accredited, but they don't, but know. they don't know. <laughs> that they're accredited, right? Right. Uh, and, and look, all 47 of them never heard of private money or private lending mm -hmm. until I did what? Right. Well, my teacher Put your teacher hat on. Right. <laughs> and none of them had ever heard of self directed IRAs. And an important thing about self directed IRAs is establish a relationship with a self directed IRA company mm. so that when you're talking with somebody, an individual that's got retirement funds, and they're not happy with their returns, then you can introduce them to sure. the rep so they can yeah. move them over, you know? Now that's a, that's a very valuable point. Cause there, you know, there are a lot of people who have heard of self-directed IRAs and who have, who have capital there, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a very small number compared to those who have their, your typical, you know, Vanguard account or whatever with stocks and bonds. And well, she, I mean, so there's a ton of broker, opportunity there. Your, your typical financial advisor never yeah. heard of them either. Never heard of it. That's so true. And yeah. they hadn't heard of it because there's no money to be made for your <laughs> traditional, you know, financial advisor. Sure. Anyway, how right. do you start conversations? Um, for the sake of time, I'm not yeah. going to share, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to share what I call the indirect method. Okay. The indirect. I like coming in the back door, right? Okay. I like coming in the back door. So here's the indirect method. Here's how I got my first $250,000 of private money. It was on a Wednesday night at Bible study here in Moorhead city. And, uh, Carol, Joe and I were going to Bible study and, uh, I knew there was a gentleman there that I wanted to talk to. And, uh, his name was Wayne. He's passed away now, but nonetheless, I walk into the foyer. Wayne is standing over there. I walked up to Wayne. Here's exactly what I said. I said, Wayne, if you got a few minutes, I want to talk to you uh, about something confidential after we finish Bible study. And he said, sure, no problem. So we have Bible study. We get together. We go down to the nursery in the building, shut the door. And here's exactly what I said to him. I said, Wayne, you know, everybody in this town. And he did. He was the original Zenith television mm. dealer. Now, mm. if you don't know what the mm -hmm. Zenith television dealer was, that means mm -hmm. you're too young to remember <laughs> life before Walmart came to town. <laughs> That's right. But anyway, I, I, I do know for the record, <laughs> <laughs> barely, 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 barely. <laughs> so, so anyway, so Wayne was very connected in, in the community, very involved in the Rotary club. And I told him, I said, you know, everybody in this town. And I said, Wayne, now here's the magic phrase. Here's the mm -hmm. magic phrase. I said, Wayne, I need your help. There's the magic phrase. I said, Wayne, I need your help. I said, I've now opened up my real estate investing business by referral only. And I'm paying insane high rates of return to people that invest with me. I said, Wayne, here's how I need your help. When you run across somebody 
that's complaining about the stupid low CD rates at the bank, the volatility of the stock market, losing money in the stock market, would you refer them to me and I'll share with them the, the program and the kind of rates I'm paying? Mm -hmm. What do you think Wayne said? Wayne said, well, brother Jay, what you got in mind, <laughs> <laughs> right? Love it. Yeah. And I, and I said, well, I said, Wayne, I said, um, are you saying that you and your wife might be interested? He said, well, yeah, we might be interested. He says, or losing money in the stock market and mm -hmm. not making much money, you know, in the, in the CDs. He says, what kind of rate are you paying? <laughs> And I said, well, Wayne, that sort of depends on the deal. I said, uh, what sounds high to you? He says, well, we're getting 3%. And that's what it was in 2009. Mm -hmm. He says, we're getting 3% in the local bank right now. So he said, I don't know, maybe 5%, 6%. I said, Wayne, I can't pay you 5 or 6%, but I can pay you 8%. He said, put <laughs> me down for $250,000. So wow. I, I went to his home, him and his wife's home the next day, mm -hmm. and I went over with them the entire program, how they're protected, mm -hmm. how I name them on the insurance policies, the mortgagee and my mm -hmm. maximum loan to value and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So then, so they, well, that 250,000 very quickly became a half a million dollars, mm -hmm. right? Now notice I didn't share any kind of deal with him. Mm -hmm. I didn't right. share any kind of deal with him, just the program. Right, now, right. I, I want to share this with you and I'll turn it back to you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. So I told you at the beginning of the show, not only have I never asked anybody for money, notice I didn't ask him for any money. <laughs> yeah. What I didn't you did ask was him for you, any money. You, you gave him FOMO fear of missing out where he's supposed to, you know, he's going to miss out on this opportunity for other people. Right. Right. I just asked for his help to spread the word. Sure. Absolutely. Right? So now we got this money and here and, and now, how do I get deals funded without pitching deals? Here's the answer. So I said, Wayne, I'll call you just as soon as possible. And I'll put your money to work for you. As soon as I got a deal for you, I said, maybe a few days, couple of weeks, whatever. So I still had those two deals under contract. Remember mm. from, from mm. the previous mm -hmm. that I'd gotten extensions on, mm. but I hadn't brought them up yeah. in conversation. Cause I know desperation has got a smell to it. So a few days go by and I call up Wayne with what I call the good news phone call, the good <laughs> news phone call. So here's the script. So I get my little handset in my hand, you know, I call him up. Wayne answers the phone. I said, Wayne, I got great news for you. I can now put part of your money to work. And, but I didn't tell him about both deals. I told him about one deal, right? Mm -hmm. I said, I've got a house in Newport with an after repaired value of $200,000. The funding required is $150,000. Closing is going to be next Thursday. So I'll need for you to wire your funds by next Wednesday. I'm going to have my attorney send you the wiring instructions. End of conversation. <laughs> I didn't ask. Wow. Them. Hey, look, the most stupid question I could have asked Wayne was, do you want to fund the deal? Well, of course <laughs> he wants to fund the deal. He's told me he's got $500,000 ready to go sure. to work. He's waiting for the good news phone call. And right. I'll tell you something else. If he had moved retirement funds to a self-directed IRA company that I yeah. recommended, he wouldn't be making any money until I put his money to work. So now sure. I'm ethically bound to borrow his money because he's moved the money at my, sure. at, you know, at my advice. Uh, you're right. Yeah. No, that's, I love it. So you, you never really, you, you, desperation has a smell to it. You, 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 you take the indirect method asking for his help and you don't really ever share the deal. Um, and, and, but it's they don't focused care. on, yeah, they don't care. Exactly. <laughs> right. And, and that's what I found too. Once, once people trust you as an operator, they really don't care about, I mean, they, they may want to understand generally what you're, what they're investing sure. in, of well, course. Well, here's the, and you just said something that's so important, Jamie, when you really get down to it, they are not investing in your deals. They're, they're investing, investing in, you. in you. That's right. They're Absolutely. investing in you. Now, of course, I'm not going to borrow unsecured money. They're going to get the deed of trust. Most people call it a mortgage. 
They're going yeah. to get a deed of trust that collateralizes. I'm not going to borrow mm -hmm. more than 75% of the after repaired value. I didn't mm. say purchase price. I mm -hmm. always bring home a big check when I buy. I mean, mm. who wants to get paid to buy nice. houses, right? Uh, my favorite <laughs> right. phrase on my real estate attorney's uh, check, and, uh, check is um, excess cash to close. I love me some excess <laughs> cash. I love that, um, yeah. But yeah, we're going to protect yeah. them. But sure. I mean, and after that first deal, they don't even care what the after repaired value is. They don't yeah. care where it is. All right. they want to know is how much and when do you need it? Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah. And I have a uh, two mortgage note, no funds. And, and, you know, through the, through the years I've operated them, it's, it's become so much more apparent to me that once there is that trust level that we know what we're doing, we, we give investor updates regularly. And I tell my team, like, don't focus on these on the assets themselves. They really, it's. I mean, we have full transparency. If you want to log in and see what we purchase in the fund, that's fine. You know that we're not stopping any of our investors, but they really don't care. They want to know, you know, when's my check hitting? When's my ACH hitting? When's where's my K one? How are, how are the returns looking? Um, and do you know what you're doing as an operator? <laughs> and so, absolutely true. So, kind of. Briefly, from say 2009 through today, you know what has your business looked like? Big picture, maybe one or two highlights. How were you able to scale? Um, and maybe one or two kind of takeaways. I know that's a lot in one in one question, but you kind of review the last 15 years for us. Just quick overview, if you would. Sure. Well, we've had we've had market uh, swings and changes during that period sure. of time, um, and so for example. When, when the market is slow and houses are not moving, like the mm -hmm. market's super hot, still where I am, no inventory, mm -hmm. you put it in the mm -hmm. multiple listing service and boom, it's gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. But it's not always like that. Sure. <laughs> it's not always like that. Right. So I will pivot during those market cycles mm -hmm. and I'll buy more houses on what we call terms. I'll buy more houses sure. uh, subject to the existing note, mm -hmm. et cetera. Because when you buy a house on terms and for, if, if anyone's listening, you don't know what yeah. I'm talking about, yeah. you know, subject to the existing note, yeah. they leave the mortgage in their name. They transfer title over. Um, mm -hmm. The rule of thumb is when you buy on terms, sell on terms, mm -hmm. like sell on lease purchase, mm -hmm. sell on rent to sure. own. And when you're selling on terms, you don't care what the market does. Mm -hmm. You don't care if the price goes up. You don't care if the price goes down because sure. you're not looking to cash out anyway. Right. 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 Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, it, dep it depends on what the market is doing, but sure. by and large over the past 15 years, yeah, the majority of my business still has been uh, fix and flip. That's mm -hmm. where the biggest profits are. You're big when you when you when you've got a, a a property to renovate or rehab, mm -hmm. the biggest profits are in the rehabs. Oh look, I just bought an oceanfront condominium seven weeks ago. Oceanfront, third story. You look like you're on a cruise ship looking mm -hmm. out over the Atlantic Ocean. Well, I bought it for four hundred twenty five thousand dollars. The renovation was a whopping $11,000. That never happens. That was just interior right. paint, a little bit of sheetrock. And so I had it for only three weeks, put it in the multiple listing service for, and I cashed out and sold it for $628,000. And I only owned the property for five weeks. I'm not sharing that story. So my net net after realtor fees was $160,000. Mm -hmm. $160, the only reason I share that story is not mm -hmm. to brag, mm -hmm. not to brag. The reason I share that story is because it's the power of private money being available mm -hmm. that allowed me to do that deal. The, the, the property was going to the foreclosure steps in two weeks from the time the seller contacted us mm -hmm. and I closed on it in five days. You can't close on a property <laughs> in five days unless you've no. got all the cash and you've got a relationship right. with a real estate attorney. I right? say not through a bank, right? <laughs> no, no appraisals, no appraisals, none of that stuff. And yeah. so having the power of private money allows you not to miss out on any deals, mm, even when you got to yeah. close fast. Absolutely. And, and that is a risk we take with this, with, with the show is, is, you know, um, one focusing on adversity too much can be problematic. And then two focusing on a abun quote unquote abundance can be come across as bragging or, you know, can actually make the listener feel 
worse about themselves. That's not the intent at all. The intent is to inspire and to show the power of, of the mindset that Jay's talking about and, and the tactical, you know, real estate and, and private lending uh, knowledge and tools that he's putting to work. So walk us through a little, in a little bit more detail, Jay, and then we'll get to some rapid fire questions. Walk us through that, that recent deal as, a, as an example, uh, just a quick case study. I know you mentioned a couple of pieces to it, but how did that come to your across your desk? And then how did you fund it and how did you exit it? Sure. So that lead, that seller lead came in as a, from a Google ad. So okay. the seller's name was Brian, a uh, younger fella. He didn't, he don't live around here. Mm -hmm. He don't live around here. Okay. So he went, he went to Google and mm -hmm. he Googled, did a Google search. I don't know what he put in. We tracked sure. about 75 different phrases. Okay. That people are searching for when they need to sell. If it's a for sale by owner, they need to sell fast. So the Google lead comes in. So when that lead comes in, it immediately goes into my CRM okay. and it's emailed to my acquisitionist. Well, what in the world is an acquisitionist? <laughs> I've had her for 18 years. Her name's Kim. She talks to all my sellers. I haven't talked to a seller in, I don't know how many years. <laughs> anyway, so she talks to all my sellers, does the negotiation, gets the information, sends me all the information, and I decide what I want to offer on the property. So it comes in, goes into our contact management. She gets it. She gets, uh, gets Brian on the phone and gets the information on the property. Well, come to find out he had two motivating factors. Number one, no, three motivating factors. <laughs> Number one, he didn't live around here, mm, not even mm. in this state. I don't. Yeah, think. so he's not he's not emotionally attached, or and doesn't have, you know, real good knowledge of the the ground truth um, as to the property value or or right. maybe the market conditions, et cetera. Exactly, yeah. and um, so secondly, it was inherited. Mm. Mm -hmm. Inherited, yeah. right? So both his father and mother had passed away. Mm. So now it's an inherited property. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, he doesn't have the interest or the time to come use sure. it. And the next big, huge motivating factor is that it's going to sale at the courthouse steps as a foreclosure <laughs> in less than two weeks. Yeah. That's a massive one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. And so anyway, he owed, uh, or his, his parents, the mortgage mm -hmm. owed $325,000. So okay. I guess he came up with his price of 425,000 cause he's happy pocketing a hundred grand. <laughs> sure. So it's a lot of money, right? Right. <laughs> and so he gives us his price. And so I, I tell Kim and all of our communication is through the software. Mm -hmm. I send back, I say offer, I'll pay all cash and close in five days, five days. So he took the offer. Um, I got two of my private lenders to fund the deal, one mm. in first position, one in mm. second position. Mm -hmm. So we closed on it in five days. And so then I already knew what the renovation needed. It needed interior paint mm -hmm. and needed a little bit of sheetrock work. And, mm -hmm. and that was it. It's not much. <laughs> we got it done in one week from the time I closed, got the interior paint done in one week. And so anyway, yes. I'm talking to him. I'm talking to my realtor. See, we stage all of our houses. I didn't go look at the house. My realtor went and looked at the house mm -hmm. and, um, my project manager, my realtor went to look at it to see if he had any different opinion on the value. Mm -hmm. And my project manager went to look to estimate the repairs. I knew all mm -hmm. that before I met, before I had my acquisitionist make the offer. Mm -hmm. So we've closed on it right? Renovations are underway, et cetera. I haven't been to the property. And so, right. um, so I, 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 we always stage all of our properties and I do mm -hmm. a music video mm. that goes in the multiple listing service. And so I'm talking to my realtor over the phone. I said, I said, Chris, how in the world are we going to get this beautiful oceanfront condominium staged? and get furniture and elevators and all that stuff upstairs. He says, Jay, mm -hmm. don't you know, <laughs> oh, no. it came furnished with luxurious <laughs> furniture and painting on the walls. I said, wow, <laughs> no, I didn't know that. <laughs> so, 
That's nobody hilarious. on the team told me it came with beautiful, luxurious <laughs> right. furniture. That's so funny. I thought you were going to say uh, AI just to you know pretend there's <laughs> furniture there. Um, so anyway, so anyway, um, we we got it, got it, uh, got got the renovation done, mm. got the music video done. Now here's a big secret on how we sell houses really, really fast in the multiple listing service. Other than there's no inventory. We go, I have my realtor do a status called coming soon on Monday, mm. coming soon. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's the coming soon status in the multiple yeah. listing service. That means that people can watch the music video. They can mm. look at pictures. They can see the written description. They can see the price, but they can't get <laughs> in the property. Right. <laughs> right. Sure. So I want to build up demand. I want to build up scarcity, urgency. And so then on Friday morning at eight o'clock, we go active, active status. Mm. You see, I want appointments lined up of the people weekend. seeing yeah. this property back to back to back, right? Sure. More scarcity, more yeah. FOMO. And then FEMO, they see each other. <laughs> yeah. FOMO. They see, and then they see each other. Right. And exactly. I, I, I would do that when I was uh, managing my own rental properties, one for efficiency and not wasting my own time but two i would uh, uh, sorry i should explain what it, what it is i'd always have the you know specific window where we meet the prospective tenants uh not not on their own time but this is when i'm going to be there from four to six or whatever it is and they see each other you know and so that it creates that it. that demand and that uh you know the ba bandwagon effect i guess if you will or and, and that fomo so okay i love the fact too that you you clearly you know, have been at this for a while and, and, and clearly you already talked about the, who is, who do I know that can help me with this? So it's clearly very much a relationship thing for you, but you've also automated your business and, and, and are not afraid of technology. It sounds like, so um, not only pivoting with regard to market conditions, but also pivoting with regard to technological advancements and uh but keeping the relationships front and center that's that's just uh top of mind a few things that i'm pulling from this so um i love the approach and and so to wrap up that deal then how did it go yeah so it went live right active friday morning at eight o'clock well on thursday night I got two all cash offers on Thursday, <laughs> sight unseen. Wow. Before it even went active. Well, they were low ball offers. So mm -hmm. nothing, nothing there. Gotcha. Right? Um, but then on Friday, I had three offers, two of which ended up being a little bidding war. Mm. And I, I had it listed for five ninety five, mm -hmm. but I had an offer for six fifteen. And then the, 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 the winning offer was 628 and listen <laughs> to how clean this offer was all cash, mm -hmm. no mortgage, no mm -hmm. mortgage, all cash, no appraisal, um, no, no inspection, inspection <laughs> no inspection. Of course it's a uh, condominium, right? What are you sure. doing? Yeah. Yeah. The, you know? Right. No Understood. inspection, um, close in 10 days, all cash, <laughs> right? <laughs> Higher so, than list uh, price. I mean, I said, what else? Know, what else could you want? Right. It's like twist, <laughs> twist my arm. Okay? Yeah. So, so there That's we amazing. go. So sold it yeah. for six twenty eight. Yeah. Paid my realtor five percent because mm -hmm. of the volume. I paid five and not six, and um, I and I only it. had and I only had carrying cost. You know, yeah. for a, for a month for a and a half. Very brief period, right? And the reason you're able to have those funding partners is because you've done so many deals prior to this and you've built sure. that reputation and they, you say, send me the money here or send them, send the wire here and they do it. It sounds like, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, uh, you wouldn't be able to pull off a deal like that without, uh, a, a track record. Oh, point. absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, again, the worst time to be raising private money is when you need it for a deal. <laughs> Right. So you want your private money lined up, ready to go. That's why I teach and preach the money comes first. <laughs> Love it. All right. Jay Connor, are you ready for a few rapid fire questions? No. <laughs> That's the first time anybody <laughs> said that. I love it. Um, 
All right. Some of these are business and some are a little more personal, uh, but we'll try to fly through them. What is a book or two that you'd recommend for my audience? I know you uh, have one, a couple of your own books, but go yes. ahead. Well, one book I would definitely recommend changed my life when I was 24 years old. I was in a very, very dark place. And the name of the book, and it's still in print, uh, the name of the book is University of Success by hmm. Og Mandino. University okay. of Success by Og we'll Mandino. And um, another book I would recommend, um, and I know you've heard of it probably, um, Jamie. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've had the co-author, uh, Bob Berg, on my podcast. And the name of the book is The Go-Giver, of course. Mm -hmm. Yep. The Go-Giver. Absolutely. Great book. Yeah. Love it. Um, how about something you've seen in your in the industry that you'd view as, or maybe that you would label as controversial, maybe unethical? Um, you don't have to name names or anything, but the, I mean, the real estate space is generally there's a low barrier to entry, so it tends to attract some less than ethical <laughs> people. So, well, sure. what would you? What would you say is a, maybe, maybe recently a, a common practice that's that's a questionable? Well, it's a common practice right now. Most real estate investors, and in my opinion, it's unethical. Most real estate investors, when they sell a house on lease purchase or rent mm -hmm. to own, mm -hmm. they'll collect, as I do, a large non-refundable lease option deposit. The actual mm -hmm. legal term is an option fee. Which okay. means that that money will be applied towards the purchase price mm -hmm. okay. if and when the, we call them tenant buyers, the mm -hmm. person yeah. renting the house gets ready for a mortgage and there's a predetermined price. So that's called the option price. Sure. It's called an option because they have an option to close on the deal, to buy mm -hmm. it, but they don't have the obligation. Mm -hmm. But they have to pay an option fee. So typically, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to get at least a 5% minimum okay. of the purchase price. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's unethical to take that money mm -hmm. without helping those people get a mortgage. Mm. Now I know from doing this for, for since 2003, the likelihood of them ever getting a mortgage is less than 5%. Mm -hmm. Sure. And since I know that, since I know that, that I'm mm -hmm. going to offer to help them get the, the, the reason they're buying on terms is because yeah. they, they either don't. they can't verify the income. They, they don't have or, other options, right? <laughs> or their credit is messed up. Sure. So I'm going right. to offer to help them get ready for their mortgage. Now I can't babysit them right. and I can't make them, yeah. but at least I'm going to say, Hey, look, I know you mm -hmm. need help getting your credit yeah. score up so you can exercise this option. Sure. So let me plug you into the credit repair yeah. company that I recommend. Okay. I love it. And I know this is rapid fire, but we, I, I enjoy in the mortgage note space, having that discretion. And I've bought a lot of land contracts or contracts for deed, which are similar to lease option. Um, and we will try to work with borrowers or, or buyers, you know, in that case. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but you're right. It's, you can't, I can't, I can't force them to improve their credit. I can't force them to manage their money well. Um, and so that is one of the most frustrating things is, is you want to help people, uh, but it, it's, they've got to help themselves as sure. well. And so, um, but I do love the, the fact that you and I, we have discretion, you know, on a deal level basis to be able to help people. Um, so, and, and that makes a lot of sense that that's unethical. Um, what would you say is one of the biggest psychological barriers that real estate entrepreneurs face today? Psychological barriers. Wow. That's a <laughs> big question. So one psychological barrier is, and you, and you and I talked about this a little bit before we went mm -hmm. li live on the show. One psychological barrier is fear. Mm. You know, psychologists can't even figure out what fear is. Interesting. Or what causes it that, you know what it feels like. Yeah. You, you know, know it when fear. you, when you feel it, right. You know, when you feel fear, but yeah. you really can't figure out how to define what it. Is it right? Mm -hmm. So people ask me, Jay, what's the best way to get started in real estate? You got to own the real estate between your ears mm. before you start owning real estate, you know, out there. Mm. What do I mean by that? Well, the first thing I mean is first of all, 
how do you eradicate this fear? Well, in the, in the context of private money, let me ask you a question. How can you fear rejection if you're not asking anybody for money? <laughs> how can sure. you fear being rejected if you're not asking? Now, I am asking for their help. I'm sure. asking them to help me spread the word, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I, can't be, I can't be rejected if all mm. I'm doing is offering to serve, mm. right? And sure. so now, now what causes this feeling of fear? One thing that causes this feeling of fear is you don't feel confident, right? Yeah. Well, well how do you start feeling confident? Well, you start feeling confident by knowing what you know. Mm. So if in the, in the context of private money, the first step in raising private money, in addition to getting your mindset, right, is you got to know your program. You got to know mm. your opportunity. You got to mm. know what you're offering. I mean, what interest rate are you going to, I mean, I say just sort of duplicate my program. It seems to work pretty well ever since <laughs> right. 2009. Right. Yeah. But be confident about your program. And, and here's a big mind shift right here. Mm -hmm. You're serving these people, these potential private lenders. Yeah. I mean, Carol, Joe and I have gotten, I don't know how many handwritten notes and hugs and kisses from our private lenders, particularly our elderly private lenders. Mm -hmm. We've changed their retirement years. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, and that is definitely a mindset shift that's, that goes a long way. And it really is about becoming empathetic and putting yourself in someone else's shoes and solving their problem and, and serving them. They don't want to do what you're doing. They don't want to no. go out and find the deals and <laughs> they want no. to put their money to work and go enjoy their their grandkids or enjoy their career or whatever that whatever else it is. So you absolutely are serving a need for them. So um yeah, I love that. Um if you could have coffee with any or or a drink or whatever whatever with any historical figure, whom would you choose? Historical figure. Wow. Probably Beethoven. Okay. Interesting. Probably I haven't Beethoven. heard that one. Yeah, probably yeah. Beethoven. Uh, I'm a pianist. I'm a composer. I've okay. been writing and recording and releasing piano music since 1997. And my stuff is in Universal Studio movies and all that kind of stuff wow. like that. It's amazing. But uh, I studied my first five years of piano. I studied classical and Beethoven was my favorite. The thing about Beethoven, I mean, you talk about resiliency and mm. not stopping. You know, Beethoven was deaf. I did Beethoven hear that. was deaf. Yeah. And, and do you know how he could hear his music? He took the legs off of his grand piano and put the piano on the hardwood floor and he would lay straight out on the floor and put his ear down to the hardwood floor and play his <laughs> compositions. And he actually wow. felt the vibration and that's, that's how amazing. he heard his music. Talk about overcoming adversity and getting to abundance, right? That's, that's, that's amazing. Um, all right. I've never asked this question. Final question. Uh, what is something you've never shared on a podcast before? Wow. Well, <laughs> I just, just popped into my head. Well, I've never shared on a podcast that I actually on Christmas day, when I was 22 years old, I played the piano in my parents' family room while Glenn Campbell sang, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Really? That's, that's amazing. <laughs> There's a story really behind cool. that, but that's uh, the bottom line. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll tell that story when I bring you back. If you have, if you have time to come back, that'd, that'd I'd be, love uh, to come back sometime, Jamie, you're a great host and interviewer. I appreciate that. Um, Jay Connor, where can our listeners find you online? Well, believe it or not, the easiest and best place to find me is at www.jayconnor.com. And I'm an ER, not an OR. Yeah, so right. J A Y C O N N E R.com. Now, here's why you want to go to jayconnor.com. It's not to look at my picture, I can assure you. The reason <laughs> you want to go to jayconnor.com is because I just finished and just launched and released my brand new seven day private money challenge. And nice. so I recorded seven videos. They're only 15 to 20 minutes long, chalk block full of how to raise private money, how to get it quickly, step by step and, uh, go to jayconnor.com. 
Um, I'll come into your email inbox every morning for seven days um, uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And so if you want to learn really step-by-step about how to raise private money and never miss out on a real estate deal, go to jayconnor.com and enroll in the private money challenge with me. Oh, I love it. In addition to that, I got a podcast with over 700 episodes. Wow. This is my seventh year podcasting. And so come check me out at, I know it's going to be hard to believe the name of my show is raising private money. (laughs) How about that? <laughs> so I'm on iTunes, Spotify, all the popular uh, platforms. So just go search for Raising Private Money with Jay Connor, And uh, I have amazing guests, just like Jamie. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Come on my show uh, twice a week, Monday mornings and Thursday mornings. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's another thing that it requires staying power and persistence. You know, it, it, doing a single episode is not really that hard, but sticking with a podcast twice a week, especially for seven years, a lot of people get what they call pod fade. And, and it just, uh, <laughs> after a year or two, it's like, why am I doing this again? <laughs> but uh, I love it. And it's a fantastic medium to build trust and, and learn and build your network and, and uh, um, you know, add value to the listener really ultimately. So um, Jay Connor, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Jamie, thank you so much for having me and God bless you. You too. And to the listener out there, thank you for spending your most valuable resource with us. And that is your time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconnor.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.